Dan, Senior Pastor at LifePoint Church. Welcome and thank you for joining us, especially if you're new to LifePoint Online. The church, though, is a whole lot more than an online video. It's a family, and we'd love you to connect with our family. If you'd like to, please send an email to hello at lifepoint.org.au and someone will get back to you. Or if you'd like prayer for anything at all, we'd love to pray for you. So send your prayer request to prayer at lifepoint.org.au. I hope you have a fantastic day today. The church online will be starting really soon. First up, here's something for the kids. Stories of the Bible The Parable of the Two Builders This is Jesus hey Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world While Jesus was on earth He taught everyone about God's love And healed people from their sickness he did many miracles like walking on water. Oh, hey guys. And even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. He asked them, Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? when you don't do what I say. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Hey, I'm gonna build here. Yeah, I'm gonna build out there. All right, suit yourself. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Oh yeah. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it was well built. I'll get it here. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. All right, hey, it's nice. Like a person who builds a house on sand. Uh oh. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Thank you.
Hey, I'm Mick. I work in commercial finance. Um, I've been in finance since I did my accounting degree and uh, I've done postgraduate studies as well. I love a lot of things. I think I love just the robustness of my faith in God. It's definitely been something that's uh, uh, like a, a boxing match. Some days I'm in the ring and I'm, I'm, I'm fighting. Uh, like the story of Jacob and the angel of Jacob wrestling Jesus, I think sometimes that's what it's like. Some days I'll bow out and I just couldn't be bothered. And that's the days that you find God's grace and mercy. Um, and that's probably what I've, I love the most. Um, but I'm very blessed with an incredible family. I have the great privilege of being husband to my beautiful wife Jess and father to my newborn son Judah um, and my gorgeous daughter Eliana. Difficult time in my life I would see is when you look at your life as a before and after moment. Uh, my life before this event and my life after that event and uh, for those that know me would know that for me a, a large before and after moment was when my mum passed. I think that was a, probably the, one of the most difficult times of my life. Um, you know, my mum never got to meet my wife, Jess. My, my children, you know, didn't get to see me learn to drive a car, uh, build a house, go camping and, and you, know, you know, preach sermons at church and, and things that you, you know, will love your parents to be there for. Went to a pretty dark place when mum died. Um, I really kind of gave it to God to, to, to save her and, and he didn't uh, in the way I was expecting. The way I responded to that was probably pretty poor. And you know, and that's probably what leads to some of those regretful decisions I made in my life. Um, and I think out of that bought, uh, brings to life um, things in me that are still being dealt with. I think there's definitely elements in such a potentially traumatic event that potentially have long-lasting effects that you then might change the way you view God or might change the way you behave in the way that, uh, you know, I don't trust God as much as I want to uh, or as really would like to, but my actions don't show that. And that can be difficult to reconcile. How do I trust God in my actions? And my heart feels still broken because I tried to trust him and he didn't come through the way I thought or expected. Probably another traumatic event in, in July 2017, um, yeah, my wife was rushed to the ICU, um, 30 weeks pregnant or 28 weeks pregnant with Eliana and, um, and uh, the head of ICU there just pulled me aside and he said, um, I need you to know that if these drugs do not work tonight, you might need to make a choice which one you're going to save. We may lose both, but you might need to choose. And I encourage you to always choose your wife. So, you know, you get confronted with that type of thing. And so we've done some counselling and, and uh, fortunately I responded to that event a little bit better than I responded to my mum dying um, in terms of how I treated God. We've all had traumatic events, I think, and, and, and you can never compare them. But I think hopefully if anyone's listening to this, that hopefully they can see that God's not to blame. And I think for me that when I look back at the, the hard um, events of my life with my mum passing and Jess going to ICU, you can't blame God for that stuff. That's just the rough stuff of this world. It's just the rubbish we live in of a sinful world. But God's, you know, looked after me through that. I love... Um, Isaiah 43.1, God says, you know, I've called you by name. And I think for me, it just particularly going through some rough stuff, just remembering that God has called me by my name. He knows me. When Jess went to ICU, um, Alicia, my uh, sister-in-law, sent us a song called Do It Again. And it's a beautiful song that reminds us of the promises of God. It reminds us that God is still faithful. God still loves me. God will still come through, even though I might still have to walk through the fire, God will be there with me and he's not, he doesn't shy away from that rough stuff either. It's incredibly important when you approach God in that he loves you and he's proud of you. 
because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not because of anything you've done, not because of anything I've done, but because of Jesus' blood on the cross. God can love us and be proud of us. And I think that's incredibly important for me. And it's incredibly important for me as a dad to raise my children in that knowledge, that they also know that their dad loves them and is proud of them. They don't have to do anything to earn that. And for my wife to know that as well. I incredibly love her. I'm proud of her. She doesn't have to do anything to earn that. I think that's incredibly important for me and it's been great for me to learn that. Hey guys, welcome to another week of LifePoint Church Online. My name's Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and this is Liv, my co-host for today. Yeah, hi guys, hi church, welcome again. Um, if you don't know me, I am the Kids Crew Coordinator, so big shout out to all my Kids Crew kids. Um, yeah, we had Kids Crew on Friday, it was awesome, we're about to have it again next Friday, so don't forget to register, um, we don't want you to miss out. Yeah, so this week we have an awesome sermon planned by the one and only Pastor Dan, and yeah, it's series... Six? No. Week six. Week six, that's yep. the word. Week six of our series. Um, so yeah, you don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Yeah, I'll give you some news quickly first though, guys. Um, our men's grill night is coming up. So hopefully you've seen that in the app. Um, you've heard us talk about it if you're at Big Church last week. But we'd love to see our blokes at that one. All the details are at LifePoint Brisbane in our app. Um, they'll probably also be on your screen now with a little QR code. So get your phone out, scan that one. And uh, yeah, register your details. We'd love to have all our blokes get to that one. Should be yeah. a fun night. Um, we're doing our August challenge as part of our Acts 2 challenge, and that is to be praying with someone uh, at least kind of once a week or so, whether it's over the phone or in person uh, or at church, wherever you can, in your tiny church, mm -hmm. just about stuff that you're grateful for, um, something that God's done or is doing that you can be grateful for through this time. Um, it's a time of, yeah, still a little bit uncertainty and, and doubt about where things are going and, and even long-term where things are going, but there's still a lot we can be grateful for. So yeah. let's be that way. Uh, let's be grateful to our God. And the last one is just our giving again, guys. There's details on your screen if you'd like to keep uh, contributing to what we're doing as part of uh, our church. Just a quick heads up, our DA is continuing to move forward. It's kind of a little bit of a waiting game uh, with council and a couple of other things, but we're doing everything we can. Our guys are still doing an incredible job, our project management group. They're getting there with that, but uh, yeah, um, we'll give you another update on that one. But um, yeah, if you whether you're contributing to, to that or to just the life of the church or you're giving somewhere else, we just love that you're giving because God loves generous givers. So let's keep doing that. One more thing is we've got a story from Chappie Nath down at Herc Road State School. Uh, we love that school. We love that place. And yeah, he's just got a little update for us. So thanks, Nath. Hey LifePoint, I'm enjoying some local produce here that I got today off this uh, guy at Wimmerian. Um Gave me 75 kilos of strawberries uh, for my school for brekkie tomorrow. Um, on the brekkie note, um, Chappie's brekkie, I'd like to do a massive thank you to John Humphreys who delivers bread every Thursday morning and also um, Rob and Leanne. And um, they are amazing volunteers, but especially Leanne, I would just want to... Um, just make sure you're supporting her and praying for her at the moment. She's going through a bit of a rough time. She heard some uh, bad news during the last couple of weeks. So um, our prayers are with you, Leanne. Um, thank you so much for your support of Chaplaincy. And this church has always supported um, Chaplaincy and we re I really appreciate it. But just a quick um, story. Um, we all know Chaplaincy is, has got some rules, tight rules of what we can and can't say. And that's fair enough. Um, but in the last couple of weeks, I've had some great conversation with a couple of kids who have come up to me and ask about God. And the parents have given that permission, uh, which has been great. And, um, yeah, just, yeah, keep that, keep those prayers and, um, and the encouragement, um, for your chappies. There's other chappies in the, in the church as well. So keep supporting them. Um, yeah, it's, um, love my job. And, um, but it's even better having a church that supports it, uh, which is great. On a totally different topic, um, it's been a, such a weird year um, for a lot of a lot of reasons and a lot of people. But um, definitely for our pastors, Jace, Dan, um, our children's and youth pastor, um, can we just keep encouraging them? Um, church might not look the way we want it to be, but it really isn't about us. It's about the way uh, on a bigger picture how our church looks for everyone, and um, they're having to make decisions on a weekly basis and. Um, yeah, it's it, it certainly it may be a little bit discouraging too at times. Um, so can we just keep praying for them, keep encouraging them, 
and uh, make sure that we be the church, not only to our families and our people around us, but also to our pastors who definitely need it um, at the moment. Um, keep rocking on, guys. Um, men, we've got a barbecue event coming up in a couple of weeks. Get to it, please. Um, it's going to be an awesome night. Um, cheers. Have a good one. Thanks, Chappie Nath, for that. We love everything that you are doing over at Herc Road. Yeah, so over to Dan now for our next part of our Apprentice series. Hey, guys. I was once invited to a party that blew my mind. I literally couldn't believe I was getting invited to it. I still remember it today. It was when I was 10 years old, and in the mail came an invitation. And as I read the invitation, I was literally in awe and in shock. All I could think of was, this is too good to be true. This might not sound like much to you, but I was invited to a birthday party to a, to a friend of mine. He was one of the cool kids and I wasn't very cool. And that, that wasn't the best bit. The best bit was when I read it. It said, Dear Daniel, you are invited to a party at Time Zone Arcade with unlimited tokens for two hours. That was the party. And I didn't have a PlayStation or an Xbox or anything like that. And whenever I went to the arcade with my parents, I got to look at the stuff. <laughs> Every now and then I might even get like a 60 second go on something. So the idea of being able to do just whatever I wanted on any piece of equipment, on the motorbikes, on the shooting ones, on the pinball machine, on some of the big fighting games, whatever I wanted for two hours, I wasn't really thinking about this guy's birthday party. I was just thinking, oh, this is too good to be true. This is so good. This is, this is what I would call good news. It was an invitation I received that I was in shock. That is what the gospel feels like. That's welcome news. That is good news. When we first hear of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his offer for eternal abundant life, it's too good to be true, except it is true. Let me make a confession to you though today. The teachings of Jesus don't always sound to me like the same thing as the salvation message of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus sometimes doesn't sound like good news. Today we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount. It's this little three chapters in the Bible. It, there's, there's lots of different teaching. It's in Luke as well, part of it. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it's when Jesus gets super clear, all right? Sometimes he speaks in parables. They're kind of hard to interpret. We're like, oh, what did he mean by that? But this one time, it seems, or maybe it was a collection of times. I don't really know. But he, he went to the mountain and he saw the crowds and it says his disciples came to him and he started to speak to his disciples. But obviously he started to speak to the crowd too because at the end it says that the crowd were amazed at his teaching. And this seems to be God at his very clearest on the mount. Now I was going to climb a mountain for this message but then realized I was too lazy. So I'm actually just here in Scarborough and you might be able to see some mountains distantly in the background. And when Jesus gets super clear, I think sometimes Christians get super unclear of what to do with it. And I find that interesting because some of the teaching doesn't sound like gospel, good news. Let me read some of the Sermon on the Mount to you right now. Have a listen. Chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you. Verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22, I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Verse 27, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Verse 38, You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. I tell you, it says in verse 44, love your enemies. These are some pretty extreme things. These are some things that I remember reading as a kid and going, what? Why is Jesus saying all this stuff? You know, chapter 7, do not judge or you too will be judged. Verse 13, 
Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What do we do with this? How do we actually read the Sermon on the Mount? How do we read the teachings of Jesus? The very thing that he said, go and make apprentices. We're in our series called Apprentice, Don't Settle for Christian. Go and make apprentices. And how do you do it? Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teach them my teachings. I don't think as followers of Jesus, we can afford to be confused when it comes to his teaching, especially like the clearest he ever gets. Some scholars believe that the Sermon on the Mount was the basis for what they taught early Christians in the first church. Here's what it means to follow Jesus. So what do we do with it? How do we interpret it? How do we read it? And more importantly, how do we apply what Jesus is saying into our actual lives like this afternoon, tomorrow? How do you do that? Well, there's a few approaches that I've been taught over the years when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. The first, the first approach is the Sermon on the Mount is information. It's good advice about life. And people can apply it whether they're not Christian, whether they are Christian, not following Jesus, or whether they're just exploring, they can, they can find this and try and apply it to their lives. It's good principles. It's good wisdom. It's just someone who's super smart because Jesus is the smartest man who ever lived. It's just giving you really good life advice. And I think that's partly true. But the problem with seeing this sermon as information is that sometimes it doesn't seem like it's true or good advice. You know, blessed are the poor. Well, we know systematically that the poor are definitely not blessed. <laughs> like on every scale, you know, quality of life, human rights, however you want to put it, the poor get a really raw deal in this world and we know that. So, so it's, it can't just be information. It can't just be something that kind of tells us about how life works. A second way to look at the Sermon on the Mount is instruction for Christians. So instructions for people that want to follow Jesus, rules basically. So here is the standard for what Christians should be doing. You should be living like this. And in some ways, I think that's true as well. It's a beautiful standard. It's a standard to try and live up to. It's something that like you look at this kind of life. Loving your enemy, do not worry, not judging other people until you've got the giant log out of your own eye first. But as you might have guessed or tried for yourself, and I, I certainly have, you'll know that it's really hard to measure up. One stage, Jesus actually says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's like, do you really want me to try that? <laughs> you want me to try to be perfect? Like, are you just setting me up to fail, Jesus? Why would you put such an extreme standard for your followers when you know we're not going to be able to do it? So then some people have said, okay, well, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not information. It's not instruction, rules that we have to try and live up to. It's actually, I call it an interrogation into our heart. The Sermon on the Mount, someone once told me this, the whole idea of it is to try and show you that you can't be good, that you can't do it, that actually you just need Jesus. It's Jesus' clever way of showing us just how desperate and how needy we are and how sinful our hearts are and how we'll never be able to live up to it. So we need someone to save us. And I think there's some truth in that as well. But surely Jesus' whole central teaching is not just to show us that we are losers. Like he's actually said the person who puts this into practice is building their life on a rock. He says it. At the end, when he's, like I said before, he says, actually, go make apprentices, go make disciples and teach them how to obey this. All the things I've commanded you. So while there's some truth in all of those, you know, information, instruction, interrogation, it's got to be more. That can't be what the Sermon on the Mount is really all about. And I put to you, there's a fourth option. The Sermon on the Mount is an invitation. It's an invitation into a new life. It's an invitation into a new way of living. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we shouldn't think, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to live up to this? All right, I better give it a shot. Or just, I couldn't be, I could never do that. That's not me. We should think like 10-year-old Dan when he got his invitation to Time Zone, the arcade with unlimited tokens. Like, are you serious? You want me? 
You're chasing me for this? I spoke last week about really counting the cost of discipleship, of following Jesus. But when I look at the scriptures sometimes, I see that when the disciples first started following, when they first enrolled into their apprenticeship, they didn't count the cost. They just were overjoyed that Jesus would pick them. They were just like, you, I'm allowed to follow you? <laughs> like, I get to be close to you? I get to be with you? I don't have to think about it for a, a second. I can just come after you. Because it's an invitation into something beautiful. Now, you might look at it and say, well, it's all very well, Dan. Okay, great. It's an invitation. But how do I actually live like that? And that's when Jesus says to us, watch this. I'll show you. See, Jesus didn't just preach the Sermon on the Mount. He lived it. And he went and he prayed for his enemies while they tortured him, mocked him, and nailed him to a cross. He lived a life where people were persecuting him and he didn't worry. He lived, a, he lived a life where he wasn't there to judge. In fact, if anyone could be judgmental, it's like the perfect guy, Jesus. He could be really judgmental, but instead he said, I've not come to judge the world, but to save it. And he did. And he looked at death and our inadequacy and our problems and sin and looked at it on the cross and he died for it. And in doing so and resurrecting again, he overcame it. And then he says to his followers, I'm starting a new thing. I'm putting new wine into new wineskins. It's just like a biblical way of saying, I'm doing something new here. It's going to start afresh. It's called a new covenant. It's actually a very Old Testament idea that one day someone would come and God would do something new. And he would not have, have us to have hearts of stone that no matter what we do, we can't get it right. He would actually give us hearts of flesh. Jesus said, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit, my comforter, and my counselor is going to come and allow you to be invited into this new way of life. For the last year, my daughter has been riding around on her bike with these on. She's been trying to keep up with her brother. She's been trying to go fast. She's been trying to go up gutters and do jumps. But no matter what she does, if you've ever ridden with training wheels, you know that they slow you down. They keep you safe but they slow you down. She can't go up things. Every now and then actually she goes in a gutter and the, it's really funny, the training wheels kind of put her back tire up. So she literally pedals going nowhere. She's like, daddy, I'm stuck. What do I do now? And that's a little bit what life is like without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus. In the old covenant, the old wineskin, it's kind of like riding around and going, getting stuck, realizing you can't do it, failing. And trying to apply the Sermon on the Mount where, with riding it with training wheels on, it's not going to work. But recently, that's why I've got them in my hand right now, she's been able to take them off. And it was really scary at first. She had no idea how to do it. But as she practiced, as she went with it, she just couldn't believe how good it was. And she, like, she's never loved riding as much as she likes it right now. Every, every afternoon, she says, Daddy, can we go for a bike ride? She, she's just free. And, and she, she rode past me the other day one of the first times she's ridden without training wheels and she just yelled, finally! Because <laughs> she went up a gutter and she just couldn't believe it. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. It's an invitation into a new lifestyle, into following Jesus where we don't go, oh gosh, where we, but where we go, finally. Like imagine this life that Jesus is displaying for everyone to hear. He's saying, a life where you love, you're so full of love that you can even love your enemies. A life where you are not worried all the time about what's going to happen as if something could be taken away from you. A life where you're not just pure in, in what you appear to do and pretend to do, you're pure all the way down. Jesus says, your, your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees at that time that would have shocked everyone because they were the most righteous people you could have like they were fasting you know every week they were fasting they knew scripture they knew the bible they knew how to be good they knew what to eat they knew what to say they knew when to pray like they were just so pure and so righteous and jesus comes along and he says you've got to be even even more righteous than this a surpassing righteousness and what he means is the pharisees have the training wheels on and they're pretending like they don't but they do I want to come and give you a new heart. 
I'm going to come and show you a new way. You're going to actually be able to do this. The Sermon on the Mount is possible. It's an invitation. Now, I know it's it's not always going to seem possible. And I know at times we're going to get it wrong. And, and just like Harmony with her training wheels off, she still has stacks. She's still like, whoa, that's, that's right. I thought there was going to be a training wheel there. And sometimes even she kind of wishes she had the training wheels back on. Because it's actually, it's a lot harder sometimes. It's a lot less safe for her. But man, it's a lot better. We need to see Jesus' teachings. Not as rules. Not as in interesting advice. Not as something to make us feel bad about ourselves. But as an invitation into something beautiful. Into a life of extreme love and extreme freedom and extreme beauty. Like what is a life, what is a world where there is love for enemy, where there is no judgment? It's heaven. And that's what Jesus is saying. Like he says in his prayer, when he teaches them to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as in your heaven come to earth. And that is a picture of what the Sermon on the Mount is. So here's what I want you to do. Everyone listening to this, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not, or you're still trying to work it out, or you've just clicked something and you found this video, I want you to consider whether that's something you want. And I want you to go read the Sermon on the Mount, maybe if you've read it before with fresh eyes. So Matthew, it's about kind of 75% of the way through the Bible. Try and find Matthew. Go to chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. There might be some stuff there that's a bit confusing, but most of it's pretty clear, to be honest. Like most of it, my son, who's seven, could probably go, yeah, okay. But I get, I get what that means. It's a little too clear, to be honest. I wish he was a little less clear <laughs> about what this beautiful life might look like. I'd love you to read it. And as you read it, think about what it is to you. It's an invitation into a whole new life, into a whole new you. It's an invitation to a new heart. It's an invitation to an abundant life called apprenticeship to Jesus. Let me pray. Oh, Lord, I can feel the wind rustling past me right now, God. And I, and I believe it's a symbol of your Holy Spirit. You want to do a fresh work in us, in our church, in our community. You want to invite us into something even more beautiful than what we're experiencing now, into wholehearted devotion and following of you and into a wholehearted abundant life into freedom like we've never experienced before. It's going to take time. It's going to be a process. We know that, Lord. But would you help us? Like me with my hand behind Harmony, helping her to ride with our training wheels for the very first time. Would you come and would you help us, Lord? May we be Sermon on the Mount people or at least trying to give it a shot with everything we've got. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Dan. Good stuff. Uh, guys, if you're not connected and you'd like to be, we'd love you to be connected. So join a tiny church if you're not in one. Let us know at hello at lifepoint.org.au. But hopefully many of you are meeting with your tiny church as we speak or sometime throughout today. Um, the other thing we'd love to hear from you, if you're going to be emailing us, is uh, stories. We talk about this a little bit, just hearing our stories and sharing them and how that encourages us uh, as Jesus' body, as the church. Um, and so, yeah, let us know at hello at lifepoint.org.au and we'll figure out how to best share it, whether it's through uh, John's videos that he's been putting together for us. You would have watched one at the start of this church online. He's been doing a cracking job uh, just sharing people's stories and who's in our church. Um, otherwise, we can share them as we host or we can put them on our Facebook page um, wherever we just love to be sharing those. So, yeah, let us know at hello at lifepoint.org.au. Um, guys, the last thing is next week we're back on with Big Church. So we're over at Grace College, you'll have to register as usual. So there'll be a QR code on your screen now for that one. Hold your phone up, get that one and register now so you can get a spot because spots are still limited with our restrictions in place. Um, but yeah, we'd love to gather together again with our church uh, and celebrate in a time of worship. So come along. We'll see you next week for that one. Mm, so good. And coming up with Dan's sermon, we just want to remind you that God loves you and his promises are guaranteed. And um, we just want to read a verse from the Bible from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 
And it says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us, by us, to the glory of God. So I'm just going to head into a song just to wrap this up today. And it's called Yes and Amen by our beautiful worship team. Thanks, guys. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Give her mercy, oh my help in time of need. Lord, I, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are All your promises, yes and no
Jesus.